I pray, would you remain standing for the word of God today? I'm going to read something from the book of Ruth, chapter 1. We're going to read the entire book, not the whole book, I'm sorry, the whole chapter 1 of the book of Ruth. The Bible says, <clears throat> In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. A man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife named Naomi. The names of their two sons were Melon and Kilian. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab to live there. When Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah, the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. And when she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people, providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. Some of you here this morning, you're coming back home with the Lord today. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and she set out to the road. The wood, notice this, she set out. She set out. Come on, say that with me. She set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Go back, each of you, your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant to you, each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed him and they went and they wept out loud and said to her, Will we go back with you to your people? But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who can become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope. Notice what she says here. Even though if there's still hope, meaning she's hopeless. Even if there was hope for me, and even if I had a husband tonight and gave birth to sons, would you wait? Would you wait till they grow up? Would you remain unmarried to them? Now, no, my daughters, it's more bitter for me than for you because the Lord, his hand has gone out against me. And at this they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me ever so severely if anything but death separates you from me. Talk about loyalty. And when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on to, until, notice, the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the whole women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Verse 20, she said, Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full. The Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? Lord has inflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth, the Moabite, whose daughter-in-law arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Listen, oh, I love that. When she arrived, after saying that her life had so much misfortune, after she had lost hope, the last verse of chapter 1 says, As she returned to Moab, from Moab, 
He returned in the beginning of the harvest. And I have a word for you today. Some of you are in the beginning of your harvest and you don't know it. You've been so caught up in everything wrong and so caught up in everything negative and bad that you have begun to forget the goodness of God's grace and mercy and the harvest is upon you and you don't even realize it. And I want to preach to you this morning from the subject of when God seems ruthless. When God seems ruthless. From the book of Ruth, we're going to talk about when God seems ruthless. You guys excited for the word of God? Come on, help me preach today. Doesn't sound like it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for this time and for the book of Ruth, Father. Father, Naomi had no idea as she's complaining about life she didn't even realize, Lord, that it was the beginning of the harvest. And Father, your word declares that the harvest is a symbolism of blessing, and change, and better, and hope. There's a lot of us here who are hopeless. There's a lot of us here who don't think our best days are ahead. And Father, I know that some of us here actually believe you're ruthless. You're mean. You've been hard on us. Father, I pray for us today here. If you would teach us your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated today. When God seems ruthless. That that word ruthless came to me, I don't know why, but a few weeks, about two weeks ago, I remember being on an airplane and reading the Bible, and I actually stumbled upon the book of Ruth, and I don't know why, I didn't feel like reading the book of Ruth, but I read the whole book of Ruth on that plane, and I realized something about the book of Ruth. In the book of Ruth, ironically, God looks to be ruthless. You read the end of Ruth, he came through, he blessed her. We know that through Ruth, because of Naomi, she got him into the right position. She met Boaz through Ruth and Boaz. You know that Ruth was a great grandmother of Jesus Christ. So we know without a doubt that in the end of this story, God came through. He was faithful. He was just. He blessed her. Naomi's life actually got better than before because that's how God says he does things. But in the beginning of the book of Ruth, in comparison to the end of the book of Ruth, the beginning of the book of Ruth, God looks ruthless. To be ruthless means to show no compassion, to show no pity or love. And I understand that we live in a ruthless world. Wouldn't you say amen to that? We live in a world where compassion is lost. Selfishness and self-centeredness is everywhere and prevalent. We live in a ruthless world where people will take advantage of you and hurt you. We live in such a ruthless world with ruthless people that there is a lot of you who have gone through some ruthless pain. And some of these people have done ruthless things to you. I'm not saying that you have done ruthless things to others. I know that's not true. What I'm saying is that I know here in this room tonight, in this church, there's a lot of you who have gone through some ruthless things because of some pretty ruthless people. And some of these people might have been strangers. And some of these people might have been friends. Some ruthless people are in your family. And because you have a ruthless family, maybe you're here today and you can say you had a ruthless childhood. Some of you work in a ruthless job with a ruthless boss and ruthless employees who have to deal with ruthless customers. All throughout your days and in your life, you're going to look around and it's not difficult to find the ruthless. 
And we all agree with that and we understand that and we say, yeah, pastor, this world and people are pretty ruthless. Sometimes life can get so difficult, so painful, downright unfair, that it almost seems like God is ruthless. Now, we know he's not because the Bible says he's a God of compassion. The Bible says God is love. We know that the Lord has sympathy for us. And we know that God is not ruthless, but what I'm saying is, if there's honest people in the house of God today, sometimes in my life it seems like I'm living the beginning of the story of Ruth, not the end. Sometimes it feels like God is pretty ruthless. It sometimes feels like God doesn't have a lot of compassion. Sometimes it feels like God is ruthless because God takes a child away from you. And no parent ever wants to bury their child. It just seems backwards. And in those moments, God seems ruthless. Sometimes God appears to be ruthless when he gets you into a position where you're sick. And the doctor tells you you're dying. God seems ruthless during cancer when it's too early for you to die. God can appear ruthless when you're divorced and he didn't come through for you and restore your marriage. God can seem pretty ruthless when he knows you're in a financial bind and you're tight with money and you lose your job. You see, I understand that God is a God of compassion and God is a God of love and God is a God of pity. I know that God is the direct opposite of what it is to be ruthless. But what I'm saying is there are some times in life that the devil can lie to you and you can begin to believe that God is ruthless. Just a little hard on you. And you're telling God, God, I just need a break. I I just need some time of peace. I need some rest. But it seems like I go from one problem to another, from one issue to the next. And God, it just seems like lately you've been pretty ruthless towards me. Can I get a witness this morning? Or is it just me? Don't sit here and say, no, my life is always, is always great. Great clap. I love that. Thank you. I feel the love. Um, Life is a series. Changes. Look at what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 14. This is a, a, a crazy verse for me. It says, when times are good, be what? Be happy. Be happy. Some of you, when times are good, you're not happy because you're so negative and say, it won't last. It won't last. Don't get too excited. Some of you, you can't be happy for others when they're happy because you remind them, it won't last. God says, hey, when times are good, you know, sometimes are good. How many of you are going through a good time right now? Can you show me your hands? See? Praise God. I hate you. Praise God. How many of you are honest enough in the house of the Lord and the witness of all these Christian people to say, times are bad. Come on, show me your hands. The rest of you, liars. Because you didn't have your hand up when you said times were good. I caught you. When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, a man cannot discover anything about his future. You know what I love about this verse? The Bible says, when times are good, because life changes and sometimes they're good. Be happy. 
But God doesn't ignore the fact that sometimes life is bad. See, look at the life of Naomi. Naomi had her ups and downs, and Naomi's life was good. The Bible says that she was living in the land of Bethlehem in Judah, and and she had her husband, and she had her two kids, and and life was good. Everyone say good. Good, all right. And then the Bible says a famine came. Can we say bad? And then the Bible says she went over to Moab, and for 10 years she settled there, and she had some food, and things were comfortable. So can we say 10 years of good? Come on, say good. Good. And then her husband died. You say bad. Some of you say good. Some of you go good. Good. No, it's not good. Husband dies, and now it's bad. But then her kids, they find wives, and they get married. Can we say good? good? And then they die. Can we say bad? You see Naomi's life? Good, bad. Good, bad. Man, this is good. Oh, that was bad. We got to stop thinking that God is going to make every day of your life good. Because the Bible says, going back to Ecclesiastes 7.14, the Bible says when times are good, be happy. Enjoy it. Why? Because it won't last. Because the bad times come. When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, did you notice that the Bible doesn't say when times are bad, be miserable, be depressed, be anxious, be discouraged, be negative. Question God, doubt, live in fear, be unhappy. No, the Bible says when times are good, Be happy. But when times are bad, consider, think about. God has made both. Meaning, when times are bad in your life, it doesn't mean be miserable. Be sad, be angry, be depressed, be discouraged, be pitiful, be a victim. You're like, Pastor, you just described me. God says when times are good, be happy, but when times are bad, consider I'm God and I'm still in control. God says, can anyone discover anything about their future? You know what God says here? When times are bad, consider I'm in control of both good and bad, and I'm the one that holds the future in my hands. God holds your future. In your hands. See, this verse shows us that through the ups and downs of life, through the good and through the bad, whatever you go through, if you're in an up, happy moment, praise God. If you're in a down, difficult moment, praise God. You praise God for the good and you praise God for the bad. Who in their right mind praises God in the bad? Only one who knows God is still God. He's sovereign, in control. All things work together for good for those who love him. And he holds my future in his hands. It makes no sense if times are bad for you to choose to live a life of depression and discouragement and jealousy and anger and doubt and confusion and fear. When you serve a God who says, I'm in control, can you do anything about your future, God says. In a sarcastic way, he says, who? Who knows the future? Only God. So if you're like Naomi, you're saying, well, I'm at a good, some of you are so crazy. You're at a good and a bad time. Hey, there's some things that are good that I can praise God, man, but I'm also having some bad times. And I don't feel like celebrating with the good in my life because I'm also, I need everything to be good to be good. No. God says, be happy. And if times are bad, 
Don't deny it. Don't fake it. We got to stop being these Christians that think life is always, like, easy. And great. Hey, how are you doing? In victory. (laughs) You know, you talk like those Christian things. Hey, how are you doing? I'm in glory. What does that mean? I want a church that says, hey, how are you doing? I'm miserable, but I trust God. I'm not happy. I'm not. No, I'm not. To be honest. Be honest. Some of you are so many go, hey, how are you doing? Pray for me. <laughs> don't be that much of a, don't be that honest. But see, times are bad. In every believer's life, times are bad. Naomi, times are good. You got a husband? No, he's dead. Times are bad. You have kids? Great. Now they're dead. Up and down, up and down, up and down. But see, life is a series of changes, good and bad. But Naomi, she made a terrible mistake. Naomi allowed herself to get angry, bitter, negative. We know that God was in control. We know that God ultimately blessed her and God ultimately was sovereign and had a plan. But in the meantime, before all of that came to pass, she chose to be angry with God. She chose to be bitter and she chose to be negative. See, when I read the book of Ruth, I realized what God was showing me. Have you allowed yourself because of your circumstances to become angry with God, angry with yourself, or angry towards others? Have you allowed yourself to get bitter and negative? Verse 11 through 14. I love this. It says, Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. And and look at the negative, bitter woman she is. I'm going to say the way she did. Why, Why would you come with me? Why? Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons? And who can become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm, I'm too old. I'll never get a husband single forever. And even if, which I doubt, but even if there was still hope, For even me. (laughs) And even if I had a husband tonight and gave birth to two sons. Verse 14. Would you, would you wait till they grow up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it's more bitter for me than for you. I'm so jealous of you because your life is so much better and mine is just so bitter because the Lord, he's against me. He's mad at me. I know it. I know it. I know God is mad at me. And they wept again. Which shows me something. Let me ask you something. Have you ever met someone like Naomi who sucks the joy out of you in life? Who's just so bitter that after talking to her, now you're crying. They weren't crying until after they talked to her. 
And there are some people, and I'm telling you, when I sit with them during counseling, or I'm fine, I'm happy. After counseling, I'm like, uh, 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 they make me cry. They're so miserable. And if you don't know someone like that, it's maybe because you're that person. Being around you just sucks the life and the joy out of everything. Notice how crazy she was. Notice that, that she made others cry. Are you making people cry with your bitterness? She said, why would you want to be with me? That's, that's low self-esteem. And then she says, I- I'm too old. That's a poor self-image. God is against me. That's guilt and condemnation. They wept. See, if you have this ruthless view of God, it's only a matter of time till you lose your joy, you affect those around you, you have a low self-esteem and self-worth about yourself, you become critical and negative. And here's the worst, worst thing about Naomi. I left it for last. It's so bad. She became a little bit of an overthinker and an exaggerator. She said, are you going to wait for me to have children and wait for them to grow up? And I'm sure Ruth and Oprah were like, whoa, 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 calm down, girl. I'm just, I'm just saying I'm going to walk with you. And you're talking about having babies and me babysitting my future husband. What, what is that? But see, she was so distraught about the downs of life that she started overthinking and planning and exaggerating. Can I get a witness today? Some of you, you're like, well, what if, and what if, and again this, and are you going to wait 20 years for me to have a baby? And if I don't have a baby, what am I going to do? Are you going to wait? Are you going to be here? What? What if? And everyone's like, girl, we just said we're going to walk with you. (laughs) Calm down. Gross. I meet people like this. You want to look at them and say, girl, calm down. You're way ahead of yourself. Stop trying to figure it all out. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, girl, calm down. (laughs) And if it's a man, say, man, calm down. Calm down. Everyone, take a deep breath. Come on. And exhale. Come on. And say it one more time to yourself. Calm down. Naomi made some terrible mistakes because when you have a ruthless view of God and you feel like God is ruthless, Some mistakes are bound to happen. You guys want to know what they are? Number one, verse 7 through 8 and verse 10. The Bible says, With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. That's good. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your own home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. He said to her, we will go back with you to your people. You know mistake number one when you let life get the best of you? You begin to isolate yourself from others. And you begin to push other people away. The Bible says they were willing to go with her. In fact, they did. So all three girls were together, and they were walking to Judah, and they had each other's back, and they said, don't worry, we're going to stick together. And the Bible says that as all they were walking, then Naomi stopped, she turned around, and she changed her mind. And she says, you know what? I want to be alone. You know what? I want to deal with this by myself. I don't need you guys. 
And she was so caught up in the people she lost, her kids and her husband, that she took advantage, she took for granted those that were actually with her, who wanted to help her and actually loved her and cared about her, and she pushed them away. If you're not careful, your ruthless view of God will make you a ruthless person to others. They were walking with her and love. They didn't have to do that. But they wanted to because they loved Naomi. But Naomi convinced herself that she needed to be alone. And I want to tell you that when life is bad and it's not happy and you're going through something, you need a Ruth in your life. You need someone that's going to talk you into some sense. You need someone that's going to guide you and be there with you. You need someone that's going to hold you when you cry. You need someone that's going to guide you and be faithful to you. But the devil convinces you, you need to be alone. You need to be isolated because he knows that when you're alone, he can get you easier. That's why when the Bible says when one sheep wanders, the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes after the one. Why? Because the shepherd knows when there's 99 sheep that are together, the wolf can get them. But when there's a sheep by himself, he's more vulnerable to attack. So the devil convinces you, you need to be alone. You can't be with those Christians. You can't go to church. You need to be by yourself right now. You can't be. You just need to be alone because he knows knows you're more vulnerable when you're alone that's why God said and he created the church you know you might think church is a Sunday thing it's not church is an everyday life thing That when one is suffering and one is hurting and one is going through loss like Naomi, we need a Ruth that says, I'm going to be here. I can't do much. I'm not going to change your life, but I'll be here for you. But you keep pushing them away. The story of Ruth tells us there's three people in this life. The first one, The Bible talks about in the book of Ruth, her husband and her two sons that died. Let me make it clear to you, there are people in your life that you need to bury. They're not coming back. They're dead to you. You're like, no, yes. But see, Ruth was so caught up in those who weren't with her that she took for granted the two girls that were with them. And you know what happens? You get so caught up in the spouse and the friends and the neighbors that, and people that left you that you have ignored and taken for granted the people that are actually with you on your side. So the first person is the one that's gone. The second person the Bible talks about in the story of Ruth is Oprah. The one that said, I'll go with you. I'll be with you. And then later on, left. See, Orpah reminds me that some people are seasonal. Some people are with you for a while, and then they're gone. Orpah is a a type of person that's with you for their benefit. And the minute they see an opportunity for self-gain, they'll leave you. They'll drop you. They'll forget the 10 years you were with them. They'll forget that you were family. They'll forget how you've been there for them. Because Oprah saw the opportunity for her life to get better. She said, bye. What I love about Naomi is that she didn't say, please stay. Don't go. I need you. Oprah realized I don't need you, so I'm out. And Naomi let her go. So there are some people that are gone. There are some people like Orpah that are seasonal. That will be with you for a while and they will tell you, I'll be with you, but it's only a matter of time till they're gone. 
And there are some people that are like Ruth. That says, no matter what, I'll be in your life. I'll be with you when you're cray-cray. I'll be with you when you're good. I'll be with you when you're not thinking right, talking about babies and all that. I'll be with you. I'll be with you even when you try to push me away. I'll be with you when you don't text back. I'll be with you when you don't call back. I'll be with you. I know you declined my call. I know you canceled your plans with me. I know but I'll be with you. And if you have a Ruth in your life, you better call him after church and say, thank you. Because I didn't realize what you meant for me. But if you're not careful, if you have a ruthless view of God, you become isolated and push people away. Second, verse 20. The Bible says, don't call me Naomi. When she got home, she said, don't call me Naomi. She told them, call me Mara. Because the Almighty has made my life bitter. The second mistake you can make if you have a ruthless view of God is you begin to confuse and compare your experience in life with the way your character should be. Let me explain to you. Naomi is a Hebrew word that means pleasant. Naomi, for some reason, the Bible points out here that she had a pleasant character. Pre-bad time. Pre-death. Pre-loss. Naomi, at one time in her life, was a pleasant person to be around with. But because her life appeared to be bitter, she made a choice that she would now become Mara, the bitter woman. See, some people, their character matches their life. And if I'm happy, it's because God is happy. And then if I'm happy, I'll be a happy person. And I'll be nice to people. I'll be kind to people. I'll treat people with respect. I'll be so pleasant to be around with. But when life gets bad, I'm going to get bad. And when life is bitter, I'm going to be bitter. And you will know what kind of day I'm going through because of my attitude. If I treat you bad, it's because life is bad. If I I'm negative it's because God is negative and you have matched your character to the experiences of your life she changed her own name declaring I will no longer be pleasant pleasant Naomi she died with my family from now on I'm bitter from now on, I'm angry all the time. From now on, I'm a bubble burster. From now on, I am negative. From now on, I'm miserable. Could it be that you're in danger of comparing your character to your life? That's how you know you're obsessed with this everyday life that you shouldn't be. Because your situation in life matches your character. And it's simple because you say, if I'm working a miserable job, I'm going to be a miserable employee. If I'm not happy in my marriage and my marriage is struggling, I'm going to be a difficult spouse. And if my kids are driving me crazy, I'm going to get crazy. And when people drive insane, I drive insane. <laughs> Naomi, well, is that Naomi? Hey, it's Naomi, the happy-go-lucky. Hey, Naomi, she's so nice, she's so pleasant. Oh, my gosh. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Lucifer. <laughs> you know, some people are like that. 
And I'll tell you, Naomi made a mistake. When life is not pleasant, don't you stop being pleasant. Because the truth is, life is not always pleasant. You can fly Spirit Airline and know life is not pleasant. <laughs> Trust me. Marriage is not always pleasant. Get ready, Frankie. Next week, you're going to discover marriage is not always pleasant. All my married folks, can we say amen? amen? Your kids are not always pleasant. Amen. Something about after two years old, I hear. And then it goes downhill. And then you're like saying, Pastor, deal with it. I'm like, I don't want them. The Bible says, through the words of David, Psalm 118, 24. This is the day. We don't, it doesn't say what kind of day. It says, this is the day the Lord has made. If it's a good day, guess what? He made it. If it's a bad day, she made it. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And you're like, oh yeah, I'm in it, all right. Be glad. This is David talking. The one who had to face a giant and never had the support of his own family. This is David who, who was thrown spears to be killed. This is David who thought his first wife loved him and she ran off with another man. This is David whose daughter got raped. This is David whose family was falling apart, whose friends turned on him. This is David who's running for his life and he said, this is the day the Lord has made. I don't like it, it's hard, it's difficult, but this is the day I know God is still in control. This is the day that the Lord has made. I can rejoice because I know God is still God. So don't you stop being a pleasant person when life is no longer pleasant. Some of you don't even know how to smile anymore. It's so ugly, you're like, <laughs> Sorry. I miss you guys. Okay, anyway, don't make the mistake of thinking your character should match your situation. I pray Monday comes, because you're feeling good right now. You're like, ooh, I like this. Listen, you're going to work tomorrow. You're going to be in traffic tomorrow. You're going to be with your kids after church. You're going to deal with people you don't like. Don't allow yourself to be bitter and no longer pleasant. This bitter world needs a pleasant person. And you are an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Give them pleasant you. Well, I don't know who that is anymore. I'll pray for you. <laughs> but just make the choice. Being angry and bitter and mad and negative is doing nothing for my life. So don't make the mistake of isolating yourself from Ruth. Don't make the mistake of becoming an unpleasant person in an unpleasant life. And I'll close with the last one. Very important. You guys with me today? Here's the last one, verse 20. I love this verse. She said to them, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. I'm bitter now, remember? I'm bitter. And I love what she says here. For the Almighty, talking about God, has dealt with me bitterly. See, not only did she make the terrible mistake of thinking her character should match her life, but the third mistake you can make is you can also confuse and compare your experience in life with the character of God. And when life is happy, it's because God is happy with me. And when I'm blessed, it's because God is proud of me. 
It must be when I went to church and I read my Bible and I prayed and that's why the Lord did this and I'm so happy because God is happy. That is not how God works. God is love. When life is good, it must be because God is happy because I'm good. But if life is bad, and life is bitter, and life is hard, it has to be because God is mad at me. It has to be that God is bitter towards me. It has to be that God hates me. This is why I'm going through all of this. God, why are you mad? God, what did I do? She made the terrible mistake of believing that her bitter life meant she was serving a bitter God. But what you're going through is not an indication of how God feels towards you. In the name of Jesus, what you're going through is not what God feels about you. But see, when I read verse 20, there's one word I saw that I said, Lord, he feels guilty. The Almighty has dealt with me. See, some of you think because of your past, because of your sin, because of your lack and shortcomings and what you did, God is looking at you saying, I'm going to deal with you. And the reason she felt like God was dealing with her is because in Naomi's life, there was unrepented sin. You're like, where was that? It's all over chapter one. Naomi felt guilty because she knew she was living wrong. She knew she made a mistake. She knew she sinned before God. And this is why he took my husband away. And this is why he allowed the famine. And this is why he took my children. Because I know that God knows what he knows about me. You say, well, pastor, what was the sin that she did? The Bible says when there was a severe famine, she went to Moab, a pagan ungodly place that God said in the book of Leviticus and Numbers, do not go to Moab. Stay away from Moab. Don't even mingle with them. But see, somewhere in the famine, she lost trust in the provisions of God and thought she would take it into her own hands. And she left Judah. She left Bethlehem, the place of worship, the place of God. And she left some of you, you left God a long time ago because you stopped trusting in Him. You took life into your own hands and said, I'm going to do something about it. And when she lost her husband and she lost her kids, the guilt came over her and the devil said, you know why this is happening because you deserve it and God is dealing with you. But the reason God allowed the suffering and the struggle was not to punish her, but the Bible says it was to bring her back to Judah. See, some of you, you've gone through what you've gone through and life has been hard because the Lord has reminded you, how do you like your life without me? Now that you've done it on your own and you've messed up your life and you've broken your family and you're living in sin, how are you doing now? Lord, I'm miserable. I know you are. I made it that way so that you would be motivated to come back to where you belong. <laughs> Judah is a place of praise, the Bible says. Some of you, you need to repent of your sins and go back to the place of praise. And say, Lord, it hasn't worked out for me. And thank God it didn't work out. Because had it worked out, you wouldn't be back in the church today. God says, I'm bringing you back. 
That's why, yes, your husband had to die. That's why your children had to die. But see, something motivated Ruth. The Bible says when she heard that back in Judah, the Lord was providing, sometimes God allows successful people in your life to motivate you. If I did it for them, it's because I want to do it for you. And when she saw that God was there and God was providing, something in her said, I need to go back. Some of you, you left God when life got hard. Some of you said, God, you're clearly not coming through, so I got to do this on my own. I believe in the house of God this morning. We're listening online. There are backsliders. There are runners. There are people feeling guilty. The Lord is not dealing with you because he dealt with Jesus on that cross for your sins. The Lord is bringing you back to praise. I love it because the Bible says when she came back in verse 19, the Bible says... She was in Bethlehem. And she's telling everyone, call me bitter because the Lord is mad at me. The Lord has dealt with me. The Lord has made my life hard. And all this time, while she's complaining and being critical and negative and mad at herself and mad at God and guilty, all this time, she's in Bethlehem not knowing that in the future, that very place you're standing will be the Son of God who would die on the cross for the sins of this world. And good is coming from this. See, you might say, well, pastor, I've sinned. I've gone too far. But the story of Ruth is a reminder that God can take your sins and your past and your failures and turn it into something magnificent. Because if God can take a Moabite, ungodly, pagan woman, introduce her to a godly man and bear forth Jesus Christ in the later generations, it's a reminder that no matter who you are, you are not disqualified. God said, I can bring you back. But the whole reason that God said, it's harvest time. In the beginning of harvest. See, some of you say, Pastor, I want the harvest of God. I want the blessing of God. If you want that blessing of God and you want to live in God's best and you're tired of being angry and bitter and messing relationships up and messing people up and messing your life up, you have to do one thing and one thing only. You need to turn and go back to God. That's all she did. Because somewhere down the line she said, settling in Moab is not going to do it for me. And some of you, you've settled when God wants to do more. But in order for God to bring the more into your life, you need to turn. And God said, Moab is not the place for you. Trust me into what I'm doing in your life. She went back. And her life got blessed. And through this story came Jesus. Because God said, you don't know what I can do if you just stop. Come back. You let life get you. You let discouragement win. You thought you can do it on your own, Naomi, but clearly you need me. Come back to praise. Come back. Some of you say, well, pastor, I'm just too far. Two weeks ago, Monday, it was a bad day for a lot of people. It was a great day for me. Monday was the day Dorian was supposed to hit, but God loves Florida, loves Miami protected us from that, but that Monday was great surf. I loved it. I said, oh, I'm going to the beach all day, all day. Day off. 
I didn't have to deal with you guys. I love you. I'm going to surf. 12 hours surfing all day. And there were moments that these rain bands would come through and you couldn't see a, a foot in front of you. And the sky was black and the, the current was ripping. And the storm was there on top of us. When I got back home, do you know I was sunburnt? I was red. I didn't put sunblock on because I didn't see the sun. And some of you were testify, I was red. And I said, how is it? I asked the science guy here. I said, how is this possible? And I'm putting aloe vera on. I'm like, man, it hurts. How am I sunburned? There was no sun. And my brother looked at me with his compassionate eyes and said, for the seat, oh, he's so dumb. <laughs> said, David, just because you don't see the sun doesn't mean it doesn't work. And I said, woo, that's a sermon there. Because the sun might be like what, Enrique, 900 miles or something? Come on, tell me. 93 million, what a nerd, look at him, 93 million miles away. So the sun could be 93 million miles away from you, covered in a hurricane, stormy and raining and black clouds, you don't see it, and it still does what the sun does. That's what God says. You may not see me, you may not feel me, you may not understand me, it may be dark, you may be in the storm, you may be far from me, but I still work. I still work. And the evidence was there when I was read that the sun still works. Do you believe in a God that still works when you're far, that still works when you're hopeless, that still works when you're alone? Don't let the storm tell you it's over. With every head bowed and every eye closed, some of you, you've backslid. You let life get the best of you. You're far from God. And you're saying, Pastor, I want to just come back to God. Some of you, you need to get with God for the first time. You're doing life on your own. Everything's a mess. Your family's a life. Your personal life is a mess. You're bitter. You're angry. You're lonely. You're isolated, pushing people away. You're no longer pleasant. You no longer laugh. You have, no longer have joy. You don't smile. You don't pray. You don't worship. You don't praise. And I'll tell you what God is doing in the life of Naomi. He's doing for you right now. He's not pushing you away. He's pulling you towards him to come back. So if you're here tonight, I don't want you to be ashamed. I don't want you to be embarrassed. Every head bows, every eye closed. But I want you to stand to your feet right now. You stand up. You're saying, Pastor, I'm coming back to God. I'm far away. I'm ashamed of my past. I'm ashamed of how I've lived my life. It's not too late for you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want you to pray this with me. This is you. And you're saying, Lord, I want to come back to you. I want to come back to a place of praise. The very fact that Ruth was placed in the life of Naomi, and because of Ruth, she was blessed beyond measure, and because Ruth was there and faithful, we got Jesus. It shows you that God was never ruthless. He always had Ruth in mind. Will you pray this with me? Let's all stand to our feet today. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, open up the hearts of those here today who are far, who are backslid, who don't see you working. Would you put a hand up to God today if you're saying, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus or I want to come back to the Lord. 
If life is hard, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. I'm in a downtime. I see your hands there. I see your hands there. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you, Father, that you are not ruthless. You are working on our behalf. When life is good, we should be happy, but when life is bad, we should consider you're still God. Whatever day we're going through, it's a day you've made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. So, Father, for every person who is far from you, for every person who is lost and confused right now, for every hopeless, discouraged, suicidal, depressed, anxious person, Father, I pray that you will give them the courage you gave Naomi to go back to you, to trust you, and see the goodness of the Lord. If this is you, you pray this with me and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for being bitter, for being angry, and for being negative. Father, I want to come back to you trust you again and rest upon you. You know the bad days I have. You know that I'm sad. You know that I'm discouraged. Tell God right now what you're feeling. As I pray this over your life, open your heart to God. Tell him what you're feeling. This is the day Lord has made. Rejoice because he is still God. He is still sovereign. May the Lord continue to guide you, protect you, and bless you. May his face shine upon you with blessing. May he turn your bitterness into laughter. May he turn your sorrow into joy. May hope be revived. May dreams come back. May desires for your word and prayer come back. As you come back to God, Father, lift up the heavy hearted. Lift up the discouraged and the broken. Lift up the depressed. In Jesus' name, we bind anxiety and depression and discouragement, knowing that everything works for your good, Lord, for those who love you. As we trust you, this is the day the Lord has made. Before it even happened to you, God already declared it. Rejoice and be glad in Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a great week. I'll see you guys next Sunday. Go in peace.